Whether or not you believe in ghosts, it's a fact that a ghost entered the law books in West Virginia in the year 1897. The murder case of Zona Shu was the first and only time the testimony of a ghost was used in a court case. In the summer of 1896, Erasmus Dribbling Shu moved from Droop Mountain in Pocahontas County, Virginia, to the sleepy village of Livesay's Mill in Greenbrier County, West Virginia. Erasmus was a tall, muscular man and decidedly handsome. He accepted a job at James Crookshank's blacksmith shop. He often introduced himself as Edward, but everybody called him Trout. Shortly after his arrival, Trout met a farmer's daughter named Elva Zona Hester. Zona was instantly smitten with Trout, and he with her. They courted for a short while and were married at the Methodist Church on October 20th, 1896. They appeared to have a happy marriage, but no one knew what went on behind closed doors. On January 23, 1897, Trout had gone to the home of Martha Jones. He asked if her son Anderson Jones could go to his house to do chores and see if Zona needed anything from the store since she was feeling sick. Once inside, the child was horrified to find 23-year-old Zona Shue's lifeless body at the foot of the stairs. She lay face down one outstretched arm and legs straight. Her other arm was tucked beneath her chest and her head was slightly tilted. Victorian custom dictated that female family and friends wash and dress the deceased. But by the time Dr. George W. Knapp arrived, Trout already prepared Zona for her funeral. He dressed her in a long gown with a high collar. He adorned her neck with a scarf that didn't go with the rest of her outfit, but he insisted it was her favorite. As Dr. Knapp began examining the body, his attempts to inspect the head and neck area were hindered by Shu. He was cradling her head and crying and responded violently any time the doctor came near. Dr. Knapp conducted a post-mortem that was more for show than for facts. Trout was oddly overcome with grief openly wailing was uncharacteristic for the stoic blacksmith. Dr. Knapp thought he ought to give the widower his privacy and concluded his examination, chalking the death up to everlasting faint. Today we call this a heart attack. He later changed the cause of death to childbirth, though Zona wasn't known to be pregnant. As was the custom, Trout held awake in his home. The mourners gathered to pay respects but Trout wouldn't allow anyone near her head. Instead, he fussed with the scarf, added a veil, and propped her head up with pillows. He claimed he wanted to make her comfortable. He went on weeping and grieving and pacing in front of the open casket until she was buried at the Soul Chapel Methodist Cemetery. Most of Zona's friends and family thought nothing of Trout's display of grief. It was odd, but not suspicious. Everyone, that is, except Zona's mother, Mary Jane Hester. Mary Jane didn't care much for her son-in-law, but couldn't quite put her finger on the reason. Zona was her only daughter and also her best friend. Zona spent her whole life in Richlands, West Virginia. It must have been hurtful to Mary Jane when Zona up and moved to the remote hills of Livesay's Mill on the other side of Greenbrier County to make a home with a person that answered to the name Trout. Perhaps it was her mother's intuition, but Mary Jane just knew he had something to do with her daughter's death. Mary Jane prayed for nights on end that her daughter would somehow come back, if only to tell her side of things or to say goodbye. After several prayerful and restless nights, just as Mary Jane lay down, a strange light entered her bedroom. The aura began to take human form. 
After a few awestruck moments, her daughter once again stood before her. Zona's ghost told her mother about the night she died. The night before young Anderson found her body, Trout came home and looked at the feast his wife prepared. She served apple, butter, and a spread of preserves, and good bread. She didn't cook any meat. This fact threw Trout into a fit of rage. He choked her with such force that her neck snapped. Zona's ghost revealed it wasn't the first time her husband attacked her. Trout had a terrible temper, and she couldn't reason with him. The spirit vanished, but returned each night for four nights. On the last night, as if to make her final point, Zona twisted her head around 180 degrees, presumably to show her mother how broken her neck was. Armed with Zona's tail, Mary Jane paid a visit to prosecuting attorney John Preston in Lewisburg. Of course, Mr. Preston dismissed Mary Jane's paranormal experience as a grief-fueled hallucination of a bereaved mother. Although he took an interest in the fact Dr. Knapp didn't perform a thorough investigation, for that reason, John Preston ordered Zona's body disinterred. So, despite Shu's objections, Knapp and two other doctors lay the body out in the town's one-room schoolhouse to give a thorough examination. A local newspaper, the Pocahontas Times, later reported that on the throat were the marks of fingers indicating that she had been choked, that the neck was dislocated between the first and second vertebrae, the ligaments were torn and ruptured, the windpipe had been crushed at a point in the front of the neck. Her neck had been fractured precisely the way the spirit had claimed. A coroner's inquest was held on March 1, 1897. Trout would accept no responsibility in his wife's death. The jury couldn't overlook the mounting circumstantial evidence and charged him with murder. Trout's trial began in Lewisburg on June 30th. He hired defense lawyers William Reekler and James Gardner to represent him in court. During this time on the stand, Trout claimed the charges were the consequences of having a spiteful mother-in-law and nothing more. He went on about the minute details and quickly denied anything at all damning. The jury learned that not only had Trout been a horse thief, but Zona was his third wife. His first one left because he beat her, and the second one died suddenly and inexplicably. The prosecution was reluctant to have Mary Jane Hester as a witness. She was sure to tell about Zona's ghostly visits, in turn discrediting herself in the eyes of the court. The defense smugly called Mary Jane to the stand, sure her story would result in ridicule. I have heard that you had some dream or vision which led to this post-mortem examination, the defense stated. Mary Jane assured them it was no dream. Zona's presence was as real as anyone in the courtroom, and she had never been more awake. Mary Jane knew details of the murder no one else did. She knew where she was killed, what she was wearing, and all of her injuries. The jury was left with circumstantial evidence, and the judge cautioned them and said, There is no middle ground for the jury to take. The verdict inevitably and logically must be for murder in the first degree or for an acquittal. The jury convened for one hour and ten minutes before they found Erasmus Trout Shoe guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison, and on March 13, 1900, Trout died in West Virginia State Penitentiary at Moundsville due to complications from measles and pneumonia. He was just 39 years old. After her death, and in September of 1916, Mary Jane Hester passed away. No further sightings of Zona Spirit has been reported. A roadside marker along Route 60 stands as a reminder of the time a ghost helped to tip the scales of justice and led to the conviction of the man that had taken her very life.